Good morning. If you will open your Bibles to Psalm 18, it's going to be our lesson for this morning. Though at the conclusion of our lesson, we will jump to a few other verses to make an application of the, the passage, our main outline will be taken from Psalm, the 18th chapter, Psalm 18. We just sang Psalm 18. Many times people hear the, what we just sang and they think, oh no, another youth devotional song. Well, it is a younger song. It's newer uh, in that it wasn't written in the 1800s. But uh, actually it was written a long time before that. It's much older. It was written uh, during the time of King David under the United Kingdom. And uh, they've taken those words and actually the song that was sung many, many years ago by David and by many others that would have great victory and then would, to try to give uh, God the glory, would then sing this song. Then it was taken and put into words more recently and they've taken just really two portions of this psalm um, that we sing in the song that we just sang. And so if you are at Psalm 18, you're going to notice um, that this passage that is written here actually is also recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And as you read through First and Second Samuel and you are able to get a, a picture of the life of David and actually Samuel and Samuel anointing David to be future king and all of the interactions and everything that's taken place there, then we're able to see how it kind of fits in the picture of David's life. And so we're going to focus mainly on Psalm 18, and we're going to be looking at three main points as we break down this psalm. The first, devotion. The second, distress. And the third is deliverance, and then we will have our application. And so we look at the very first, uh, the three verses that are at the very beginning of this psalm, verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. It's a beautiful passage, and most of us are probably familiar with verse 2 uh, most often, and, and it's a beautiful uh, passage that's been written by the psalmist looking at this beautiful devotion, this, these words of praise that acknowledge who God is. And as you read through the psalm, really the whole of the psalm, Psalm 18, really has a militaristic tone to it in that David is king and he fights many battles on behalf of God. He is a person of battle and of war and we can see that as we read throughout his life on behalf of God. And so as you read the outset here, he's stating that he loves God. God is the one that has provided for him. God has been the one that has been the strong anchor. And often we sing a song, We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock that shall not move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. The principle here in the, is very same in that we have that anchor just as David had that anchor and he was holding on to God. God is that solid rock. He is the buckler. He is the shield. He is the high tower. He is the one that David leans upon. He is the one that David loves. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And an acknowledgement as you move throughout the chapter, and especially the latter part of the verses that, that precede verses 7 through 50, you'll read of all of what we would call maybe some of the exploits, some of the pictures of the things that David has been through, how some enemies have been against him, he's been in war, he's been in battle. And ultimately, in all of this, 
David's going to point to God being the one that would deliver him in all of those times. He points to God being ultimately his strength. And so that's why in verse 3 he says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Now I think I've heard that and maybe even the song. And I thought, it's a question. We're asking the question. Who is it that is worthy to be praised? But you could also look at it in this way. I will call upon the Lord who is actually worthy to be praised. The one, I will call upon the Lord because He is the one who deserves praise, who is worthy of praise. He is the one that I will call upon. And I believe that holds the the text here. And then, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And you're going to see that as you read throughout the psalm that David is going to declare that God has provided salvation from him from all of his enemies. And so you see this, this great devotion that the psalmist has for God Almighty. I will say this at the outset and then we will continue to move through the lesson. You'll see at the end of the lesson how this ties together. But this... This psalm has a dual purpose. As the psalmist writes this, he's focusing upon his life, actually what he's going through. And so David is talking about what he faces on an everyday basis, and he looks back at his own life, and he recounts some actual events in his life and how God has provided for him, and that there is none other that deserves praise and honor and glory than God. And he wraps it all up. And so there's that initial looking as you look at the psalm, but then you look at it from another perspective. And and then we will look at this psalm from our perspective, looking back and not only seeing David, but seeing what how God would provide salvation through the line of David to a great Savior that would come down through the bowels of Jesse and David, ultimately to bring us Jesus Christ. And then we're able to see how that all connects together. And so you can see the psalmist writing this, and and he's thinking about his life, and he reflects upon his short span of his life and how we see application. But then as we move forward, we're going to be able to look at this psalm and then see the greater application, looking to the Savior, and then even application to us today as we recognize how God has provided for us. How God is a Redeemer. How God is a Savior. How He is the one that truly is our Deliverer. And so as we move through the psalm, David looks at his own life and he gives devotion and praise unto God. There is none other that is worthy. Then you can see the distress that David is going through in his life in verses 4 through 6. I love reading the psalms frequently because of the the relevance in in real life. Because, you know, sometimes you read uh, other places in the text of the Bible and maybe you don't see some of the, the, the struggles and maybe the difficulty. But when I read the Psalms, it, it just reads like it's very real life, that this is this he's going through a hard time. He acknowledges God is great, there's no other to be praised, but my life is challenging. When you reference back the psalm that I mentioned, we have an anchor that is steadfast, but what about the boat up top? Though the billows roll and the sea is tossing our ship to and fro and it's challenging and it's hard, we've got an anchor. And so it gives us a picture, even in the midst of this, as David is writing, he's saying, and by the way, I have this anchor, but let me tell you, I'm up top and the sea is tossing me to and fro. It's not always easy, but ultimately we have that anchor that keeps us steadfast and sure. In verses 4 through 6, he says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. David acknowledges that there are people that are around him that are really challenging him. There are people that are godless and that challenge him on a daily basis. They are enemies. There's difficulties. There are trials. 
that he faces. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. So this picture is real life, and that is that it's not always what we might picture. Somebody might say a primrose path with no thorns along the way. It pictures the fact that even in his life, even though he acknowledges God and, and he knows that God is worthy to be praised, he acknowledges that while he's here on this earth, it can be turbulent. It can be very difficult in distress. He cried unto the Lord, unto God. So here are those tears that often fall upon the page of the psalmist as we read through his life. It is not without tears as he lives in this world. It's not without distress. Even though he's a believer in God, a man after God's own heart, still there were tears and there was distress and there was a calling out to God. In this verse, he says, He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even un into his ears. So you start off reading this great devotion and really the exalting of these characteristics in the nature of God, especially in verse 2. And then you read about how challenging life really is in the life of David. And he will recount a lot of that as he moves forward in this psalm and much of the difficulty that he faced. And then you go on and you read about then deliverance. And so David really is brought to his knees by events that he faces in life. It brings tears to his eyes. But he holds on to God. And that's something that we can learn from the psalmist. That no matter what comes and floods may come and challenges may hit us very hard that make us fall down in distress and pour out tears, that we can hold unto God. And He is a great provider. And He will be there. The deliverance that we read about is found in verses 7 through 50, the remainder of the chapter. We read together, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. And darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he did send out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discord discomfited them then the channels of the waters were seen and the fountains of the world were discovered at thy rebuke O Lord at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils he sent from above he took me he drew me out of many waters he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. I believe that this verse in the latter part of verse 18 really encapsulates the whole of the psalm. As he talks about how great God is, some of the distress, some of the tears, and some of the things that he describes in the midst of all of this, and, and he tries to paint a picture of the, 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 the chastisement of God upon the enemies of God's people. And what a beautiful picture it is as he begins to paint this. And ultimately, what does he say? This is too much for me. I, can't, I cannot do this. I rely upon God. My God is great. There is none greater than my God. 
He is my stay. Verse 18. He brought me forth also into the large place. He delivered me because He delighteth in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He hath recompensed me. I'll pause here for a moment, and it's interesting as the psalmist is writing this, we know David's life. And I love the fact that you can read about David and you read about this, the fact that he's a man after God's own heart, and yet he was not a perfect person. For we can clearly see that by many of the very large mistakes that he made. Terrible choices. Choices to directly rebel and sin against God. But his heart was after God. And when he was addressed by maybe Nathan the prophet who said, Thou art the man. You're the man. David repented in sackcloth and in ashes. Psalm 51. And in tears, he wept and begged for forgiveness. We see many different cases where David made poor choices, and yet ultimately he would always come back to God. And yet in this instance, you can see that, that God had no problem chastising or, or punishing David, even when he had this horrible sin. The child that came from adultery was taken from him. God punished him for this sin. So even though when David, even as a man after God's own heart, did wrong, God punished him. But God also blessed him when he chose to do that which was right in the sight of God. And so David in this mentions these things as he's writing this song. I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all His judgments were before me and I did not put away His statutes from me. I want you to think about that for a minute. There are many that you can read about, even kings that would lead God's people as you read through the accounts of even the divided kingdom and how awful and wicked they were and how they turned away from God's statutes and worshipped idols. And then you set that comparison beside David. I mean, he messed up. But did he just turn away from God? Did he set aside God's statutes and say, I'm not going to listen to God. I'm not going to follow His ways. We know the answer to this. I was also upright before Him. I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in His eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man thou wilt show thyself merciful up right and with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure and with the froward thou wilt show thyself froward for thou wilt save the afflicted people thou wilt bring down high looks ultimately god will provide for those that seek him he will bring low those that are prideful and arrogant that they do not turn to him Verse 28, For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop. And by my God I have leapt over a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. Really, verse 30 is another one of those key verses as you're reading through all of this. And David, it is interesting as he talks about some of the things that he's, he's had to do, maybe some of the battles and some of the triumphs and struggles, and how he's had to run through the middle of these enemies that have come to him to try to take his life. And he says and acknowledges it is by God's grace, by God's power and provision that I am here, that I have survived. And then the beautiful verse 30, as for God, His way is perfect. David acknowledges who God is. He builds him up in every, every chance he has an opportunity to do so to say ultimately God is a great God. He has provided this for me. And when I was in a bad place, God was there for me. He's made provision for me. God is an awesome God. The Word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. God's Word stands. 
Many today will try to stand against it, but God's Word is tried. It stands. And God will be there for those who trust in Him. What is David acknowledging through all of this? I have trusted in the Lord who is worthy to be praised. You can see that trust that is here. And then you continue to read, he says, verse 31, For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon high places. David acknowledges that any success that he has had has been a direct result of God and His blessings. Not because David is an amazing warrior. He, David the psalmist is writing and, 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 and you can hear behind his words. David is saying, Goliath didn't fall because I was good at what I did. He didn't fall because I could use a slingshot well. He fell because God is a great God. And He provided the victory. He provided for me. Verse 34, He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up and thy gentleness hath made me great. David is a great king. It is true. Why is this? Because God has provided this. Verse 36, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. Verse 38, I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength under the battle. And thou hast subdued me under those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them. Even under the Lord... But he answered them not. Even the enemies, even atheists at points in time will cry out unto God. And that's the picture that's given here. Even the enemies of the Lord, when they're pressed, will cry out. And what David acknowledges is God was with him. Their crying out was not true faith. They were not really trusting in the God of heaven. Verse 42 then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. As I stated at the beginning, this psalm has a military um, sound to it. That's what's driving behind it because David is this great king. He's a military leader. And that is what is driving behind the tone that is said in the psalm. Verse 43, Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and Thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. Verse 44, As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be out of their close places. The Lord liveth. Verse 46, another key verse. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You sang it this morning. You sang it this morning. The Lord liveth. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. David was not taking vengeance on his own. God was providing this. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, Thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto Thy name. Great deliverance giveth He to His King, and showeth mercy to His anointed, to David, and to His seed forevermore. You see this great deliverance that David mentions that God had provided this great deliverance for him. And so you have that ultimate devotion at the beginning of the psalm and then you see the distress that David is in and ultimately the deliverance that would be provided unto David. Now we make the application for us today. Isaiah chapter 11. Turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. 
Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You know, it's interesting in this psalm as we mention this stem that's going to come out of Jesse. David is the son of Jesse. And then down from David, there would come something that would then provide ultimate deliverance. And so when you're reading through the psalm and you're talking about how great God is, He's a rock, He's a buckler, He's a shield, He's a strength. I will call upon the Lord, He shall deliver me. And then you go and you begin to read how God was going to provide that. You can see how God provided that for David himself. But why did He do that? Why did God provide for David so that ultimately his seed would be preserved? And He did that for you and He did it for me. Because when we go to the prophets, they speak of then that root, that rod, that branch that's going to come out of ultimately David who is the son of Jesse. In verse 10 of this same chapter, Isaiah 11, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an inside of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek. Oh, speaking of the sweet Savior, Jesus Christ. And His rest shall be glorious. Verse 12, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. We know that this has reference to the coming of the Christ. This very day during our Bible class, we were there in Jeremiah chapter 30 and we're reading about how they're going to be saved. And again in Jeremiah it's talking, of course, about what's happening there at that current, present time, but then even looking to the future, to the Christ, and how He would be providing salvation in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 9. Our text, even for our class this morning, he says, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up to them. That has reference to Christ. That has reference to the root of David that would come down from the bowels of David. David. And so when we go to Matthew chapter 1 and we read in Matthew chapter 1 and you read all the genealogy that is there. I know when we have Bible readings, everybody wants to get in line to stand before the congregation and read Matthew chapter 1 because it's the easiest one to read all of those names. Uh, being facetious, it's always a challenge to read through all the names in the genealogy. But there's a reason why it's there. Most people, when they start reading the Gospels, they pick up Matthew and they go to Matthew 1 and they're, they're like, skip. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go past that. Let's get, let's get on. Because uh, it's just a bunch of names, but we're going to make meaning of it right now. Why was David preserved? Why was he personally delivered and his bloodline delivered so that God then would bring deliverance to you and to me? Through Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, when it begins to list all of those that are listed here, I want to go down to verse 5. You've got uh, one that is very well known. Boaz beget Obed of Ruth. And so you've got the book of Ruth connected to the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And then Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David the king. And then it keeps on going down. And ultimately, in verse 16, we get Jesus, who is called the Christ. And in verse 21, And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, what a Savior. The provision of God is seen so clearly. As we read, even going back through the Psalms, as we try to understand, why would, why would God provide this? And why is this really important? Well, it was important that, yeah, yeah, you know, David, 
trusted in God and he loved God and God provided for him. Yeah, that's important. But as you begin to step back and you begin to see the bigger picture that is there, and you see why this is placed within the Word of God, it's there, yes, for David's immediate faith and his life and his trust and the provision God provided for him immediately in his life. But it's also there for us to be able to see that God provided over thousands of years to bring the Savior into the world. Romans 15 is the text I want you to turn to now. In Romans chapter 15, we can begin reading in verse 8. He says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. There have been many promises that had been made going all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob flowing all the way down just as those genealogies we just read picture. And yet as you continue to go down, he says, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing thy name Psalm 18. Psalm 18. This was written by the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome and he quotes and references Psalm 18. Why? Why is he talking about Psalm 18? He's doing it to show us the promises of God, the provision of God, the deliverance of God has been made possible through Jesus Christ who's come down from Jesse, David, through the bloodline. He saith again, Rejoice ye Gentiles with His people, quoting Psalms over and over. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud Him, all ye people. Psalm 117, 1. And again, Isaiah. That's the passage we just read. Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, I don't know about you, I don't have the Judaistic bloodline in me. I would fall under the line of Gentile. And I would gather that most would, assembled here today. And so as the writer, the Apostle Paul, inspired of God, is pointing us to all of these fulfillments that are taking place, all these prophecies that, that go so far back to the Psalms, to Isaiah the prophet, and all of them point now to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You notice in verse 16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering to the gospel of God. The offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Ultimately, Paul is telling us that he's been able to go and to take this good news to the Gentiles of salvation for all people because of the provision of one, Jesus Christ, who came down as a root out of Jesse through David to provide us the Savior and to provide us salvation today. In Acts chapter 13, we can see the connection of all of this and it's, it's minished, mentioned in the middle of a, of a beautiful sermon. You've got the, uh, the Apostle Paul and it's the Sabbath days in the synagogue and they asked him, do you have any word for the people? Now that's common in, in Tanzania. And uh, if you were over there and, and if you're visiting and maybe you're a gospel preacher and you just happened to land in some congregation on a Sunday and your visitor there, they would say, do you have any word for the people? You got anything that might encourage them or uplift them. And the Jews also did this. They had this practice asking of the rabbi here. And then in verse 16, Paul stood up and beckoning with his left hand said, Men of Israel, you know, and ye that fear God, give audience. And he begins to lay out the history of these people, taking them all the way back, all the way through Egypt and the deliverance God provided, taking them from the time of Samuel the prophet and Saul, the first king of the United Kingdom, to the second king of the United Kingdom, David. You notice there in verse 22 of Acts chapter 13, and when he had removed him, he raised up, that is, removed Saul, 
He raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And of this man's seed have God, according to His promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. You see, Psalm 18 is a beautiful psalm because it, it shows the deliverance that, that God provided for David and how David trusted in Him and, and, and this beautiful picture that is there in his life was turbulent. Things were hard. Tears came down. There was distress. David leaned upon God. He trusted in God and God provided for him. Yes. But you stand back and put it in place of all of the Bible. And you see the great promises all the way back in Genesis. Given in Genesis chapter 3. Given in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. All the way down, going very far back. The promises that were given fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Who, by the way, had proceeded of David's seed, the son of Jesse. God raised him up to be a savior for you and for me. Sometimes we wonder, we read through these things and we may miss it. Or we're reading the psalm, it's a beautiful picture. And then we stand back and say, you know what? God provided for me. You look at thousands of years of history, thousands of years. And God made all of these promises and, and He was there to make sure. Why do we have the book of Ruth? It's there for a reason. It's not just random. The book of Ruth, you read through Ruth and you're like, why is this here? It's there for a reason. As you continue to read through in the various things that are recorded in the Word of God, they have a red thread that starts at the beginning and goes all the way through. And you can see the ultimate salvation of God when you see the provisions of God that He provided. How He would bring through, even through David, and provide for Him ultimately to bring about Jesus Christ. You wonder, how did David survive all that? David was a man of war. You know how many people died on their sword during the time of David? I mean, thousands and thousands of people, all of these battles were fought. And he survived to bring about the Savior, Jesus. How could that be possible? How could these prophecies be true? Long time before. They can be true because God is a God of all things, creator of all the world, creator of everything that has ever been created. He is a great God, worthy to be praised. And He has provided for you, He has provided for me, deliverance from sin. Today, will you come to the Savior? Today, will you with your lips confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world, the resurrected Messiah? Today, you can do that. If you believe that Jesus Christ is that, you today can confess that. You can say, I want to turn away from my past. I want to repent. I want to live for that Savior. I want to change my ways. And today, I want to submit to Him. He's commanded me to be baptized. That's what I want to do. I want to be saved. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do according to Mark 16 and verse 16. I want my sins washed away. I want to be delivered. Then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be baptized so that my sins can be washed away. Acts 22, 16. God provides. Will you come to the Savior? If you have a need, won't you come? As together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.